native people, native culture, native knowledge. Hi, I'm Jeannie Green, bringing you award-winning Heartbeat Alaska. Bringing you national and international native news, this is award-winning Heartbeat Alaska, the premier native voice in native programming. There's a heartbeat loud as thunder Revolution is in the air Heartbeat Alaska, here's Jeannie Green. Hello and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska, native news and native information. I'm Jeannie Green. Today we are honored to present kayaks and canoes, native ways of knowing. And it's a traditional watercraft documentary from the Alaska Native Heritage Center. A beautiful trip back through time and taking you right up to today. We learn how the natives throughout Alaska have made watercraft traditionally. It's a great show. I'll be back with Kayaks and Canoes right after this. My name is Jane Nicholas. Hi, Jenny. We'll be right back. Many Alaska Native cultural traditions and skills are passed on from one generation to the next only by word of mouth. Our ways of making traditional boats were almost lost forever. To preserve this knowledge, eight boats representing five major Alaska Native cultures were constructed at the Alaska Native Heritage Center. Master boat builders shared their knowledge and skills. Kayaks and canoes, native ways of knowing. Hi, I'm Mark from Scan Home, and we are proud to sponsor Heartbeat Alaska. Scan Home, serving all of Alaska's home and office furnishing needs. Thank you, Scan Home, for making Heartbeat Alaska possible. Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Bristol Environmental and Engineering Services, serving Alaska since 1994, a subsidiary of Bristol Bay Native Corporation. Support for this program provided by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska. We've been giving Alaskans the support they need since before Alaska was even a state. And we'll be here when you need us. We're here. We're with you. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska. The gift of past experiences handed down. There are no greater lessons. By the Nature Conservancy of Alaska, working with Alaska's rural communities to conserve and protect our natural heritage. The Alaska Native Heritage Center is a cultural center here in Anchorage, Alaska. It's also a center of learning. And today, we learn from them through this beautiful documentary called Kayaks and Canoes. For Alaska's native people, boats were more than just a means to get from place to place. They were their livelihood. Boats were used for hunting and gathering. They brought friends together and enemies. Stories traveled on boats. The boats were honored and had spiritual value. For thousands of years, the knowledge and traditions of Alaska's native people were passed on from generation to generation only by word of mouth, making their preservation very difficult in the modern world. Our ways of making traditional boats were at risk of being lost forever. The Alaska Native Heritage Center in Anchorage is working with elders and tradition bearers to preserve and promote our traditional ways. During the summer of the year 2000, eight traditional Alaska Native watercraft were built by master boat builders at the Alaska Native Heritage Center, representing five major Alaska Native cultures. The Athabascans from the interior, the Yupik and Jupik from southwest Alaska, the Inupak and St. Lawrence Island Yupik to the far north, the Aleut and Alutik from coastal areas of the Alaska Peninsula and Prince William Sound, and the Iyak, Tlingit, Haida, and Simsian people of the southeast. The diversity of kayaks and canoes built by Alaska's native people 
are a testament for traditional native ways and our mastery of natural materials. Many of these boats have not been built in more than 50 years. Each tells a different story. Kayaks and canoes, native ways of knowing. The traditional homeland of the Athabascan people lies in the interior of Alaska. Vast forests of birch, spruce, and cottonwood trees dominate the landscape. The land is rich with moose, birds, and other wild game. Thousands of lakes and rivers provide fish for the Athabascan people. The Athabascan birch bark canoe was used for hunting and to transport people and their supplies on the rivers of Alaska's interior. The knowledge of how to make a canoe covered with birch bark was passed down for thousands of years among the Athabascan people. It is very difficult to locate the right kind of birch bark. The right bark must not have any tears or holes in it, and it must be strong and flexible. The bark will peel off the tree correctly only in the early summer. The women who dig and prepare the spruce roots look for a tree standing apart from others. So it's when you start digging up the roots, there's going to be too much uh, other roots. So block it off, it makes it hard. Once the roots are gathered, the bark is taken off and the roots are split before they can be used to lash the canoe together. Moses Paul learned about the traditional Athabascan way of life growing up in fish camp. He learned to build the birch bark canoe from his grandmother. The bow of the canoe is carved from curved grain spruce from the trunk of the tree where it joins the root. Moses and his apprentices carved each part of the canoe frame by hand. He feels it is very important to pass this information on to the next generation. My feelings is that uh, I was very fortunate to have my parents who were good enough to teach me what they have done all their lives. The apprenticeship, the young man that would be going with me, he never worked around building canoes. That would be a new experience for him. For Moses, it was important to build the birch bark canoe in the traditional Athabascan way, without using commercially available lumber, nails, or screws. This is as close as we could get it to put the canoe together the way the grandmother taught me. Birch bark is well suited as a covering for the Athabascan canoe. Okay, that's the way it's supposed to be when we put it on. Before it is sewn on the canoe, the birch bark is soaked to make it easier to work with. The bark is tough and durable, yet light and buoyant. And the one thing we've been taught is never, never make shortcuts. The frame of the Athabascan canoe is built from white spruce wood. Traditionally, it was lashed together with spruce roots and animal tendons called sinew, or strips of moose or caribou hide called babish. Birch bark was used to cover the frame. Finally, the seams of the canoe were made watertight with spruce pitch. You can take this canoe in the metal flats. Some say our cultures are being lost. Many people, like Moses, are working hard to save them. But a lot of people have said, and uh, stories have been said, that its uh, tradition is rapidly losing its ground, and hopefully we can rebuild it. Not one nail in the canoe. David Salmon is 88 years old. He grew up in the wilderness 200 miles away from the nearest village. His father took him to live in the woods to escape the ravages of tuberculosis. During those years, David learned the Athabascan ways of life and survival from his father. When he was 18, David moved to the village of Chalkitsik. Today, he is both an Athabascan chief and a Christian minister in Chalkitse. My father used to make a canoe back in 1922, 
I was a little boy, and I watched him pretty close. He told me and he teach me, this is the way to do. Now this, this is the place that we're gonna bin. All parts of the canoe are prefabricated. From right here to this bone, round bone right here, the change in measure. Tom O'Brien is an anthropologist who is working with David to preserve Athabascan ways. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. Let's see. You hold it. Spread. Sure. You spread it. How much you want to spread more? More, more. Spread it. Okay. More far you can, you can. There. There. <laughs> Before making the frame, the spruce wood, the spruce roots, and the birch bark must all be soaked. Soaking the materials makes them easy to bend and work with. Oh, good. Let's see. <laughs> people from the south, people from the north, people from the east, people from the west, come and say ha ho with me. Ha ho means great things happen. Come and say ha ho with me. Ha ho with me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not a good singer anyway, but I sing loud. <laughs> yeah. David stained the frame of the canoe with a natural dye made from crushed rock. Structural members are attached to a rigid floorboard that carries the weight of the occupants in their cargo. This prevents pressure from being placed on the bark covering. Gonna be okay. After I tie it, we'll sing another song. <laughs> Don't worry, straight canoe. After the spruce is soaked, parts of the frame are shaped on a pre made form. Heating the wood alters it, giving it a permanent memory of the curved shape. Is that what you wanted? That's a basket canoe 2000. After the parts are assembled, the frame is lashed together with spruce root and synthetic sinew, or strips of moose or caribou hide called babish. All of the boat builders working at the center had difficulty obtaining natural sinew made from animal tendons. Man made materials such as waxed nylon were substituted. In the Gwich'in Athabascan region, where David lives, virtually all summer travel was done by boat. The Athabascan canoe was strong enough to carry hundreds of pounds of meat and supplies, but light enough for one man to carry on his shoulder. The design of the canoe allowed it to be swift and easily paddled over long distances. Traditionally, women sew the birch bark onto the frame. The frame is placed on a dirt mound covered with grass. The mound elevates the canoe so that the sewers avoid spraining their backs. Wooden stakes are placed in the ground next to the gunwales of the canoe. These stakes provide a form to shape the birch bark. Look at that! Ho ho! Ho ho! Spruce root is used to sew the birch bark to the frame. First the hole is poked in the birch bark. Then the spruce root is drawn through. Go through. Oh, thank you. The story. Story. This is the rain chaser. When uh, we have a rainy weather for a long time, like for the last one week here. Well, people get tired of rain. I used it for three times this morning, and look here. That's a rain chaser. The design of the Athabascan birch bark canoe has not changed in thousands of years. Athabascan people, they never been changed. For a thousand, ten thousand years, they were here in this country. Canoe like this and other tools like this, they're, they're not changed. Nothing changed. American changed, I think, so they, 
think different, they think different, you know. <laughs> but as a Baskin, early days, they were same thinking people, same hunting, they have rule for it, they do the things in the same way. I live pretty good in my father, grandfather way. To make the canoe completely watertight, spruce pitch is melted and applied to the seams of the birch bark. People from that there in the north, the north means J J A, J N A, and the west is the east J J N E, and the south is J J A, and the west is J T. I'm noisy minister anyway because I have been minister for a long time, you know. I'm a noisy minister, you know, praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to sing and join us, tourists and all. After tying the last knot, the completion of the canoe is celebrated. <laughs> Like all other Alaska native groups, the Yupik people believe that the land is the giver of life, that the land provided everything they needed to sustain their lives and culture. The Yupik live in the yukon kuskokwim River Delta in southwest Alaska. It is a harsh environment. Winters are long and cold. During the short summer, the frozen tundra becomes a marshy, treeless plain crisscrossed by rivers and lakes. The Yupik kayak is an incredibly versatile boat. They were used for transportation, hunting, and gathering food. They were sometimes lashed together for use as a sled, or used as a shelter when hunting far away from home. It takes months to gather the material needed to build the Yupik kayak. The kayak is made from elements found in the natural world, driftwood, sinew, seal skin, seal oil, moss, and grass. Each part of the kayak frame is built from a special piece of wood. In a treeless environment, men would sometimes travel hundreds of miles to find the perfect piece of driftwood. The seal skins used to cover the boat are harvested in the early spring. Preparation of the skins begins as soon as the harvest is done. Traditionally, men built the kayak frame during the long winter months. All Alaska native cultures use the crooked knife, called mushkak in Yupik. This knife and the technical knowledge that goes along with it were passed down from generation to generation. Frank Andrew. This is my grandfather. When he went to Adama, my father is me. When making a kayak, each detail of the boat is crafted with care and attention to detail. It must be strong enough to carry up to a thousand pounds of cargo, flexible enough to withstand the pounding of the ocean waves, and engineered to maneuver safely. Frank Andrew is one of the last of a generation of elders who grew up in the Yupik men's house, the Kazgik. When the Qazyak gave way to Western-style housing, the place where traditional knowledge was passed down and where kayaks were built disappeared. This wood comes from the stump of a tree, the grain curves matching the shape of the piece. If straight-grained wood were used, it would crack down the middle. A lot of time and effort went into this. Members of Frank's family formed Kayanik, a preservation center located in the village of Guigilnok, where Frank lives. The goal of Kayanik is to preserve and pass on the craft of kayak building to future generations. Frank worked very closely with his family at the Alaska Native Heritage Center. While the men shape the parts of the frame, the women prepare to sew the seal skins onto the completed kayak. Braiding the sinew strengthens the seams. We twirl it. You twirl it first like this. Caribou or beluga whale sinew was traditionally used to sew the skins. A thread made with cotton twine was substituted. 
When the kayak is placed in the water, the braided strands swell and seal the seams. There is a reason for every detail. This sophisticated joint is designed to withstand the shock from an impact or a severe wave without breaking. The frame of the kayak is stained red with wheat rock, a crushed red rock, ochre mixed with water. Frank explained that the wheat rock is mainly for protecting the wood. The ribs are bent to shape using the teeth. Each part of the kayak must be perfectly crafted because the parts may not be recut or shaped after they have been joined to the frame. Traditionally, the frame was lashed together with strips of seal skin. Braided nylon was used here. Each kayak is made specifically to fit its owner. Each part of the kayak is measured and cut according to a scientific system based on the lengths of various parts of the owner's body. It is critical that the women sew the sealskins on the kayak frame in one sitting. Most of the sewing is done after the skins have been stretched on the frame and temporarily tacked together. As the women sew, they pull the braided sinew through the tough skins. They maintain the proper tension by wrapping the end of the skin around their foot and using a small rounded wooden block under the skin as they pull the sinew tight. It took 22 hours to sew the skins for this kayak. Marianne Wilkinson. Before I did, uh, it was like, no, so they can put that in a couple of weeks or, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't take, it's not like that. It's, it takes a lot of time. I realize it's, it's a lot of work. I'm just happy that I was involved in making this kayak because I get to realize that uh, my ancestors went through a lot of work. They didn't have a whole lot of things. They had to make kayaks with what little they have. After working for more than 15 hours, Frank and his family were finally ready to pull the skin on the frame at 2 a.m. <laughs> the skins must be stretched to the perfect tension on the kayak frame. If they are too loose, the kayak will not be watertight. If the skins are too tight, they will crush the frame. The kayak is sealed with a special mixture of moss and seal oil. Many scholars and even Yupiks do not know that some traditional kayaks were painted with special designs. This eagle painted on the deck is Frank Andrews' family crest. This design has been passed down in his family for generations. VHS copies of this video are available. For information, contact the Alaska Native Heritage Center at 907-330-8000 or visit our website at www.alaskanative.net. 
The focus of the world is on Alaska. Beyond the borders. You're invited to a party. Heartbeat Alaska. Native news and native information. I'm Jeannie Green. This program sponsored in part by Phillips Alaska. Dreamers who make it happen. I like to dream. Heartbeat Alaska chooses the Longhouse Hotel, the official hotel of Heartbeat Alaska. And this is where we choose to house our guests that come from all over the world to spend time with us. And this is where we hope you will choose to spend your time when you come to Anchorage. Choose the Longhouse Hotel, the official hotel of Heartbeat Alaska. Well, it started with radiation. They made a mask that fit her head, a mesh mask. And when they'd lay her on the table, they would bolt her head to the table. So it, it was sheer terror for her to go in a room and be put on a table and have your head bolted down where you can't move, and then have a huge machine shooting radiation at your head is a pretty scary thing. Mom, Dad, we're best friends, right? Guess what? I'm about two seconds away from dumping you, kicking you out of my life. You won't even recognize me. And pretty soon, someone's going to try to get me to take drugs. Want to do something about it? They're going to have to make me tell you where I am and who I'm with every day. No matter how much I fight you. Don't like it? Tough. you got to be the grown up. Thank you everyone for joining us for Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Native Information. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to get your emails. Look for Heartbeat Alaska next week right here. God bless every single one of you and we'll see you next week. Oh,